The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. I'm Patrick, Head of Technology at professional services firm Collins SBA. I'm a former financial advisor who just loves solving business problems and creating better client experiences using technology. Join me each week as we unpack the tech on offer to advise professionals, stay on top of tech trends and help you break free from the analysis paralysis experience when building and maintaining a great tech stack. Wealth is about more than just money. It's about opportunity and progress. NetWealth is supporting financial literacy and education in primary schools through Banker, a fun, interactive platform for children to learn about money. So far, we have sponsored and given over 100,000 children in Australia free access and want to reach even more. Discover a world of community at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. To give listeners of the Advice Tech Podcast another avenue to solve technology problems that matter most and efficiently evaluate the landscape of advice tech providers, Ensemble has launched an advice tech space on its platform. If you want to know how your advice peers are solving their tech challenges, big and small, it's the place to go. Head to the Ensemble platform or use the link in the show notes to join today. Today we're chatting all things CRM with Alex Walker. So Alex has over a decade of experience when it comes to being involved with enterprise tech sales or SaaS solutions. And by enterprise tech, I mean Oracle and Salesforce, which are your big junkies, as our former host Peter D would say. And some of those other big junkies I would include here are HubSpot, Zoho CRM, and Microsoft Dynamics, to name a few. This conversation is quite broad, but I wanted to get Alex's insight into what he believes the key functions of CRM actually are why businesses buy enterprise-grade CRMs, the importance of having a clear strategy and data management framework in place before implementing something like this, some of the capabilities having a CRM unlocks and things to take into consideration, budget, timeframe, et cetera. We're almost five years into our CRM journey with Salesforce specifically, and honestly, I can't imagine life without it. Like, How did we actually operate? And the answer was working in silos, double and triple entry into separate systems through lack of integration, spreadsheets and inconsistent client experiences. I started by asking Alex what the oldest piece of tech he still owns is and whether he still uses it. Yeah, it's a great question. I thought about this for a while because technology spans over every kind of thing that we use today, right? So obviously we're talking about CRM, but for me, uh, one of my passions is, is golf. And I have a little uh, old putter, bullseye putter that I use. So that would be the oldest tech I use, but I have a one-year-old. So do I use it? Probably not very often. Not as much as you want. Nice. <laughs> no, that's cool. And yeah, first, I think, piece of sporting equipment. I think, yeah, we've had wheelbarrow and, and pen and things that aren't probably traditionally tech, but yeah, first piece of sporting equipment. So that's good. Yeah. And, golf, and then golf is constantly evolving in terms of technology around, around equipment. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> no, it's a good example. I love it. And yeah, speaking of tech, is there maybe one or two ways that you're using AI either personally or in your work life? There is. And this is so relevant to today. So I think there's such a broad spectrum of AI. I'll just start with that. So when someone says AI to someone, it could just mean something completely different. And a perfect example of that is uh, when you're typing an email and it starts to anticipate what you're going to say. Uh uh, all the way along the spectrum to generative AI. So I think we all use AI to some extent, but aren't really aware that we're using it. So, uh, you know, obviously I use AI every day through you know, common tools like email, but at the moment I'm coming to terms with what generative AI means and where the sort of line sits. So at the moment, personally, I'm not too comfortable using it to the full extent because I'm trying to understand it more and it's, it's a bit of a mission for me. So uh, I've done some cover letters for resumes is probably the, 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 the furthest I've gone and then edited it myself. But, uh, you know, being in technology for such a long time, 
I find the first iteration of something is not usually the best. No, I love it. And yeah, great example with the the resume or the, the cover letter where you've got that sort of blank canvas anxiety, um, you know, taken care of with the template and then you can make it your own. And yeah, once again, too, with things like Gmail and Outlook, just being able to get those micro efficiencies with the finishing the sentence or one or two words, it's yeah, really relevant. So great point there. So before we jump into all things CRM, do you mind taking us through your your origin story, Alex? Sure. So I have been in enterprise technology sales or software as a service sales for oof, over 11 or 12 years now. And that spans over cybersecurity, middle back office software such as ERP, CX, uh, covering CRM, uh, middleware integration, collaboration tools, and uh, marketing in a nutshell. There's a few other offshoots, but fundamentally those are the, the types of tools I have been positioning to the market for that amount of time. So yeah, I think there's a really re- interesting lens I take to conversations with with these types of discussions, particularly to customers or if it just comes up in general conversation. Um, if you think about that journey, uh, it kind of encompasses majority of things that companies consider when they're trying to do a transformation of technology. Like they need to understand what the core engine of that generates their business, which is, you know, uh, in an ERP, which is your general ledger, uh, how is your data secure, and then how are you going to engage with your customers and what's your acquisition and customer service strategy, which falls into the CX um, realm. So, you know, that's my journey in a nutshell. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I take a, a very sort of holistic view when, when you know, discussing this topic because it's not as simple as CRM. CRM is a broad term. Yeah, no, I'm with you. I guess just just on that, you mentioned yeah, CRM, it is a broad term. Do you mind maybe expanding on, you know, what you believe it is or just giving us an overview of what you believe it is and why, you know, businesses should consider it valuable, whether that's to monitor or iterate or develop or to upgrade? Like yeah. Give us some cliff notes there. Right, so let's break it down. Yeah, yeah. The, the acronym, <laughs> CRM, Customer Relationship Management. So it's pretty prescriptive, right? If you're a business, you're selling a service or a product. And to do business, whether it was 20, 30 years ago or now, you still need to capture those uh, interactions uh, for reflection, uh, strategy, and documentation, compliance, and regulation or privacy, whatever it may be. So, you know, a lot of companies don't even have CRMs still these days. It could be Excel. It could be making notes on your notepad. If we're talking about wealth management or some of the other financial firms that are a little bit behind uh, where some of the other businesses are. So CRM is a way for you to capture, record, and uh, appropriately manage your processes from acquisition all the way to customer service, retention, and loyalty. They are the main aspects of what a CRM retains. Yeah. No, I love the definition there. And I think I'm just reflecting on our our journey versus your point around some businesses don't even have a CRM. Like we were probably in that position, it would have been about five years ago now. So, you know, three business divisions, so financial planning, accounting and business coaching, all using sort of separate systems as the source of truth. And obviously that contributed to, you know, with that silos of workflow or process or information. but you're right. Like saying we don't have a CRM, but how do we operate? It's really using tools that aren't designed to be CRMs or aren't CRMs as CRMs. So I assume you would have seen that a lot yeah. um, over your it, time. Yeah, absolutely. So if we work from the bottom up and the top down, uh, and this doesn't mean that the big enterprises don't struggle too, because they do, uh, and it doesn't mean that the the startups and the SMEs are killing it because they because they are. So, you know, there's a, there's a bit of a, a stigma there, but I guess a, an enterprise could have a, like a 50 to, to 40 different CRMs depending on their lines of business because there's so many different types of capabilities out there. I guess the, the message really to majority of businesses and, and that, that we try to convey is it's okay that you're not doing things appropriately because technology is ever evolving and... There's a broad spectrum of the way that 
customers perceive CRM. So, you know, it could be Excel, it could be HubSpot, it could be your mid-market um, sugar CRM, it could be sales, it could be Oracle, it could be your in-house proprietary built system. It could take any form. So, uh, you know, it, it does depend on a couple of things. So, yeah. the... the what I see in my job and, and what I've seen over my career is it comes down to a few things such as strategy and like what's not working and what's the uh, what's the appetite for the business for change. So you could have an unsatisfactory CRM, but if they're okay with it and they're happy trundling along in that fashion, uh, so be it. But uh, if they're trying to get more market share and overcome some competitors, then they need to look at the processes and how they interact with their customers, whether it be from acquisition, better customer service, uh, more effective marketing, uh, whatever it may be. And that comes into investment to into technology. And these days, it is really with uh, the, the demographic of customers are expecting better technology and more efficient uh, customer service, not just, you know, not just... Uh, expecting a robotic voice, they want they want personalised actual uh, interactions, and that only comes from investment in technology and you know the the leading technologies, etc. Yeah, love it. And I guess yeah, just to pick up on the point there around like robotic voices or or a lack of relationship there. I mean, the mantra in our business, I mean, it's always been like this, but it hasn't really been achieved, and it's always obviously a journey. But the mantra has been so clients only have to tell us their story once. So it also extends to, you know, when we're providing referrals to third parties. So whether that's a lawyer or a banker or a broker. So, you know, a CRM that holds all that information or that can surface that information sort of where and when that we need it is essential for us. And, you know, you mentioned as well, you know, acquisition. When you've got something in place like a, you know, it might be industry agnostic CRM, it makes it a lot easier and it become it can become a lot clearer as to how you're actually going to onboard that business. Yeah. And it you know, it means it potentially there's five or ten less systems that you need to onboard, all of these new users that you're going to inherit when you make that acquisition. Have you seen have you got like any examples or any case studies of where, you know, using an enterprise grade CRM or CRM that is industry agnostic has been a really great tool for that acquisition strategy. Yeah, absolutely. So it comes down again to the business and what they're trying to achieve. Ultimately, yeah. that that really comes down to why customers consider investing in technology and changing the way that they do things. Uh, so let's just take an example of a small wealth firm that is looking to be bought out. If they don't have the compliance and the history of their customer interactions it's going to be a very messy acquisition process yeah so if we think about the large firms they have a different challenge they've got too much going on so so to change it's going to be very difficult because there's too much bureaucracy there's a lot of bureaucracy and a lot of red tape so uh you know there's a lot of there are different challenges depending on the type of business but ultimately, it, it does come down to talking to the, the leadership of that business and understanding what what they're actually wanting to change for. Because technology is technology; it's there, it can be used, it's always going to, going to be there. But uh, CRM is a tool that should add value to your business. You're not going to uh, adopt it for no reason. That's no, it's a brilliant point. I think it's often overlooked. It's you know, sort of trying to refer to you there as. Uh, what if you are the business with the CRM looking for acquisition, but the fact that you can turn it around and go, you actually, if you want to be acquired, if you want to have your valuation uh, improved, then having proper systems processes in the form of a, you know, enterprise grade or just a rigid, robust CRM with clean data is pretty important. Absolutely. Right? And and there's always uh, privacy and compliance that's ever evolving as well. So if you want to not be penalized by the bodies like APRA and ASIC, you need to keep up to date. A lot of a lot of financial institutions uh, are focused on a few different things off the back of the Royal Commission, which is, uh, you know, complaints management, uh, customers are expecting, as we said before, better service, better customer service, personalized interactions with their agents, 
and their representatives. And when something perhaps most often goes wrong, nothing goes perfectly, they may make a complaint. There is an expectation and a compulsory uh, regulation to that company to respond, capture, and resolve that complaint within a certain time frame. And if they're not doing so in the appropriate manner, persuade to the RG217 or uh, RG, it's taken a few iterations, that uh, that acronym, but it basically speaks to complaint management. If they're not meeting that criteria, they're in breach of uh, ASIC. So it is a big thing and the, the, the impacts to a business are fines and being uh, top of the list of not, putting your customer first and not resolving customer complaints, which if you think about it, are pretty bad labels to have on whatever product and service that you have because it pretty much says that you're not you're not putting the customer first, which at, to the, in today's uh, economy, it's always customer first. Definitely. And I think, yeah, it's a great example of something to elevate out of a spreadsheet and that actually probably can't be tracked or managed um, adequately in a spreadsheet at all. If you know, let alone the sort of non um, or sort of financial planning specific software or CRMs. I mean, have you got any other any other sort of key maybe capabilities that maybe a CRM would unlock for you know talking wealth management or you know professional services financial planning businesses? Yeah. So if we look at wealth management, effectively what they're providing is financial advice in whatever capacity it may be. So it could be uh, setting up a trust for your your siblings for a university fund or putting money away for whatever the, the goal is. And typically, if we look at wealth management, that has been done quite manually and still is done today. So I think what companies are trying to do in that space is provide a service or a process that allows their customers to feel a little bit more heard and a little bit less frustrated. So if we think about the process, if we've all gone through a wealth advisor or an accountant, uh, they, you know, without talking down to the industry, it, it, it could be done better is what I'll say. And uh, it, it, it's quite hard to change an industry like that that's done that for many years but there's simple things that you can tick off and bite-sized pieces that you can change, such as, uh, you know, DocuSign instead of manually scanning and signing documents. Uh, or if you provide an SOA or a statement of advice, allow that to be, uh, you know, electronically signed so they don't have to come into the office. Or um, allow them to, to, to provide you with um, information where they can take and provide you with uh, a solution without having multiple interactions. And if we bring it back to CRM, that's exactly what that provides. It gives you the ability to fast track what used to take weeks or months to get your outcome to perhaps if we look at the uh, from, from prospecting all the way from lead management to the funnel of customers coming through to your business, whether it be uh, inorganic or, or organic, all the way to proactive pros- prospecting, whatever, the, however that business has come through to your door, um, acting on that quickly, and then giving the customer a really good experience where they don't feel like uh, it's taking uh, an eternity. Yeah, no, great points, and I think yeah, it it feels like um, a lot of these sort of standalone. I'm saying standalone from the point of view of you know tech stack or piece of tech in a financial planning or professional services business that. That CRM is often used as the you know leads and opportunity style replacement tool for the financial planning CRM. So whether that's you know prospective clients and then coming into things like deals or opportunities where you're starting to track you know new business and how advisors are tracking in that regard. Yeah. But also what you mentioned too around things like DocuSign. Obviously, you're alluding to the fact that once you've got you know a proper CRM in place, you should have that ease of integration to then basically do as many things as possible without leaving the CRM or using your CRM to trigger off those things. I mean, it's funny now to reflect on it, but we had one of our, this is pre, pre-Salesforce, pre so 
this is why it's funny now, but we had one of our accounting accounting team members call the client about an accounting query or just something. And that client was actually literally in the same building. So they were downstairs <laughs> in a meeting with their also called SBA financial advisor. So a great example of why we needed a CRM. But in Salesforce, as an example, that's just a classic, a classic look at the activity timeline of you know, events that are synced up with with Outlook or your um, you know, email service provider, your meetings, your calls, your interactions and your tasks. So Yeah. Yeah, that I mean one quick example. No, yeah. no. That, that's a really good point because if you talk about wealth as an industry, you've got firms that do one or four or five different services. So, you know, trust and estate planning or uh, accounting or wealth management and advice. And yes, it is, a, it is a challenge where the customer perhaps wants to use multiple services and the, the departments aren't talking to each other, nor do they have the information in front of them when uh, they could probably look up the customer record on a CRM and understand that they're already using that service. And when the customer reaches out to them, they already know that they shouldn't talk about this because it's already there. Uh, so it just it goes back to the personalization point I made, I made before. If a business has visibility across their services and products and the interactions that they've had with those customers prior and moving forward, it just creates a better experience for for that customer or uh, that prospect. Yeah. And yeah, just to expand on that, like in terms of our experience with, with Salesforce as well, like before then and even until recently or about 18 months ago, we were all using different ways of billing and invoicing at a divisional level. So you know, it looks like one business but you're receiving a proposal in a completely different way than you would a different business division. And obviously we've been able to, well, not obviously, we've been able to consolidate that into one process so the client sees that you know, they know what they're receiving. It feels and looks familiar. And now we can actually do joint proposals with with multiple business divisions. But yeah, I, I mean, I wanted to I wanted and to ask you about could just like just one more point on that is the marketing aspect as well because customers yeah uh, businesses are always trying to uh, get more face time with their customers. So wallet share in wealth is quite uh, important. You're always trying to yeah. position more products, cross sell, upsell. So you don't want to be selling them, uh, sending them irrelevant information that they don't want. So understanding what they're using and what what footy team they go for, what how many kids they have, uh, where they live, what socioeconomic background they come from. Uh, you understand they don't want a newsletter understanding what the Nasdaq's doing <laughs> and, and tick them off that yeah. list because you know that's gonna you know negatively impact that. Uh, that's that sort of overall strategy of retention. No, I'm with you. And, you know, we've only recently been able to decommission our sort of dedicated financial planning um, CRM. So that has meant that all of our sort of fact find or client financial information or mostly financial information has been able to come into Salesforce and we've been able to turn off that tool. But, you know, starting to see you know, just the reporting and um, sort of informational capabilities that that has created for us is really easy examples like clients that haven't had their will updated for 10 years or clients with upcoming lapsing death benefit nominations, just being able to hone in on that and make our you know marketing team's job a lot easier and also just have that visibility for, as you mentioned, like additional opportunities that that client or that advisor might not have thought of, but also the advice team as well. So if, if everyone can see that information and it's not in the advisor's head, you've got more people being able to help that client in ways that are beneficial for them. That's right. That's right. And, you know, if you've, you've got Teams, you've got Slack, you've got multiple tools that can offshoot from a CRM that could be used as collaboration to share opportunities and leads in a different, in a, different, in, in a more effective way. So, you know, a lot of people don't have time to log into the CRM every day, particularly financial advisors that don't yeah. aren't used to using these sort of tools. So having a, a line of communication where you can share these leads and opportunities, you know, bring that to the forefront of them and make them aware that this change has happened so they don't say the wrong thing or, you know, say something that negatively impacts the, the relationship. No, that's, that's a great point actually. So actually embedding um, key information from your CRM into those sort of team collaboration apps like Slack and, and Teams, it makes a lot of sense and also, 
yeah, just the, it eliminates a lot of that context switching of, of jumping into CRM, jumping back into your collaboration tool. I mean, I wanted to ask you, you know, we've probably spoken about how, you know, the, I mean, the right time for us to consider implementing CRM was because we just didn't have one and we were multiple business divisions. And there may be any other signs that either a company's probably outgrown their current CRM or it's time to consider enter, uh, to consider implementing maybe an enterprise grade CRM. Yeah, this is this is a, a really interesting point. And again, I'm going to repeat myself. It really comes down to understanding. It, I'm a salesperson, so it, it's my job to understand what the business is trying to achieve. Because ultimately, we do, they don't want to invest in technology for no reason. So. If you look at the the startups, uh, they're trying to scale really quickly. So that the, the way that they undercut the larger corporations is by providing really, really close contact and personalized services. So they they think from day dot they want to have the best and they want to be the best because they want to grow quickly. And they've somehow come up with a product or a service that. Uh, there's, where there's a gap in the market, and to do that, they need the best technology to move quickly. If we look yep. at the larger uh, corporations and, 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 and enterprise uh, businesses, they have a different set of challenges uh, and objectives. So it's it's more around we are losing market share, and it's because of we're not doing this well enough, or we're losing market share to these competitors. So it's really how do we uh, make our processes simpler and more effective. And remove roadblocks from what we used to do that's got us to growth to a certain point yeah. and uh, make collaboration and processes more efficient. And, and there, 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 there are, there's a couple of examples of why it would trigger an organization to perhaps do a pro project or a, a full transformation. And I'm probably going to hit you with another generalist question, but maybe one that a salesperson wouldn't like so much. But have you got any comments on on like the budget that you can expect, like or anticipate if you were going down the sort of enterprise route for CRM, like ballpark figure in either dollar term or percentage based term? I know it's really difficult to give us an exact number because everyone's different. But any comments there on how much we're going to spend on a project like this? Yeah, can I ask a question with a question? Yes. So budget is effectively what a business has to spend. But when we're talking about investing in technology, it's about what's the appetite for change. Yeah. So they're two different things because uh, a budget is how to keep the business operating, making a change because you're wanting to grow fast and or wanting, wanting to overcome some challenges on staying not bankrupt and, you know, be a, be a video easy or... Uh, blockbuster, yeah, or, blockbuster, yeah, yeah. or or uh, can it, or whatever the ones that have gone missing. Um, they're different so yep. budget is interesting because for me, it doesn't start with budget. Obviously, you want to spend your time as a salesperson with someone that wants to spend money, but at the yeah. end of the day, you need to understand what their their appetite is and what what they're trying to achieve. So, budget is something that needs to be there, but you need to. It needs to, we really need to understand what the cost of doing nothing is, yep. not the actual budget of what they have to spend. It's like what is the impact to the business of not doing this most of the time? Because yep. in my experience, when I've come across businesses that want to you know, invest in CRM, they're either wanting to do it because uh, the CIO wants to uh, make a name for himself and look good and make sure he's doing his job or they actually have a real problem that they need to fix. And it's, it's about qualifying is is this is this real and what what you were trying to achieve and if it is something that they're invested in budget is literally an afterthought because if you can prove to them that you're actually going to improve processes and uh, make sure that the what whatever the the the, the three five ten year strategy is CRM is going to help that budget is not a problem yeah. No, I love that framing and yeah, what you're saying there is basically the opportunity cost of yeah, not doing anything. I love it. And obviously, we've got the initial investment. So, we're calling it an investment now. It's not a budget. And then obviously, we've got the ongoing cost associated too. I assume, you know, in theory, that gets it gets easier over time as you are able to uh, implement and 
create more functionality within the tool that you've just purchased. So I assume you would get more bang for buck over time. Ideally, yes. Yeah. That would be, uh, if you did it right, that would be what you would want or would, what you would hope for and what the vendor or development team would provide to you because let's not just pigeonhole this into buying something off the shelf. A lot of businesses yeah. actually have a large development team and develop CRMs themselves to solve these problems. So if we're talking about CRM, yes, you can buy it from someone or a vendor, but also with a, a number of businesses, they have very smart people that can build the exact same thing to sweat to their specific needs. So that's another question businesses ask themselves. Do we want to go out to market and buy something yeah. that perhaps needs a lot of configuration and cost in professional services or can we get our dev teams to do exactly what we want? Inherently, it's it's like about you know time, time, time to value. We want something. What's the quickest and most efficient and most cost-effective way to, to get it done? So I, I guess that's from my view what businesses ask themselves the majority of the time. You need – if we're going to take – uh, a vendor route, for example, uh, yeah. things they need to consider are sof- software subscription costs and um, license. So, if we if we break it down, if I t- can take a step back, maj- the last 10, 20 years, if we look at software as a service, it's uh, a you know a license subscription cost model. So, the more you invest, the better price you should get. So, which is being shifted at the moment. Uh, so, if that is the route that your business is going down uh, and you're implementing a solution from some of the top tier firms, whether it be Sugar CRM, HubSpot, Salesforce, Oracle, Zendesk, whatever it may be, uh, usually there is a subscription cost and then there is an implementation professional services cost. If we take that a step further, uh, there's either a, a partner that's involved to implement that solution, or you have your in the vendor has an in-house professional services team. So it's uh, a capex and an opex cost to the company to to roll this out, and a lot of the time uh, they 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 weigh that up. And if you have a a really switched on procurement team and and IT team, they know this, and if they're going out to market, they've already disregarded doing it themselves. Yep. And I assume I just wanted to ask you as well about, you know, typical time frame for implementation, but I assume that really depends on, you know, you mentioned, you know, switched on teams. If if you've got businesses coming to you where they haven't done all that heavy lifting or analysis prior, I assume that makes that journey take a lot longer when it comes from, you know, decision making to full sort of deployment. Yes, that's right. So yes, my job for the past or for many years has been selling software. But equally yeah. or more importantly is educating businesses on how to uh, implement technology effectively. So if we get the indication that uh, they have not done the right amount of research on how to implement yeah. what they're trying to achieve, we will respectfully uh, give them the information that they perhaps have uh, overlooked and – I think any uh, respectful organization will not sell something to a business if they get the feeling that they don't need it or haven't done the right amount of research yeah. to think that there's a better, more effective, cheaper way to do it. So uh, I think that's an important point because that's why companies come to companies such as Salesforce and uh, Zendesk and HubSpot and Sugar and, and any other upcoming vendor. They're looking for that uh, trusted advisorship and if they're reaching out to vendors, it means that they're tr- that they're asking for advice. So it's our job to sell them something, but it's also our job to understand that they know what they're in for. So, yeah. yeah. No, I love it. And I'm also just reflecting on a point you made too about building it yourself. Like one of the reasons why we went down the Salesforce pathway was just the ability to sort of stand on the shoulders of giants there and you don't have to worry so much about the – I mean, we still have to worry about upkeep and change management, et cetera, but you've got, you know, three-plus releases a year. You've got, you know, some of the biggest businesses in the world using it as well. Like you've just got that comfort that, you know, if there's businesses of this caliber and size using it, then clearly um, obviously that's a very, you know, high-level way of looking at it, but clearly you're on the right track. 
That's right. So if you look at software as a service as a value proposition, it is taking the the burden away from the business yeah. to manage it themselves. So if you look at multi like cloud first multi tenancy, it's allowing uh, that business to manage that software for them and take that burden away from that business. And that's effectively why these large software as a service businesses have been so successful because they guarantee uh, security, uh, compliance, and continuous updates and innovation. Yep. No, and they're all things that are critical and can allow you know business decision makers to sleep at night. Um, yep. Alex, is there anything we've missed? Is there anything you want to leave us with before I let you go? Not really. I think if we're looking at emerging trends, AI is definitely top of mind and I think it's a buzzword that has ta- gone a bit out of control uh, yep. because it's AI has been around for years and ChatGPT, as an example, has got every, everyone in a spin and it has immense value and a huge amount of uh, potential. So it's got everyone's attention but I think the biggest thing that I've found working with businesses that want to make change uh, if they don't have their data in order, they're not going to be able to uh, execute on some of these uh, upcoming trends. So if we look at CRM as an example uh, within you know, financial services, they need to, and most of the time it's not at their forefront of their mind, they have the outcomes and they want to, to be uh, at the cutting edge, but if we look at the enterprise size businesses, um, a lot of the time it's a bit of a mess. So it, it's it's about uh, understanding how we can first position good data in, good data out. And if that's not in place, it's very hard for them to execute on getting those really, really uh, the extreme value of that, that, that AI can, can achieve. So I think... That's probably the most prevalent uh, challenge that I've come across uh, yeah. recently. I could give you a lot more, but uh, that's probably most relevant. No, I'm with you. And, yeah, classic case, as you've alluded to, of rubbish in, rubbish out. But also, as you also mentioned before, classic case of strategy, like what are you trying to achieve with AI? And, yeah, just skipping those steps of, of trying to, you know, chase that shiny object. I'm totally with you. That's right, yeah. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, Alex, thank you so much for your time today. I've really enjoyed the discussion on all things um, sort of big, chunky CRMs. What's the what's the best way for someone to progress the conversation and get in touch with you? Well, I'm on LinkedIn, Alexander Walker. Um, I live in Melbourne, so I'm not hard to find. But, uh, yeah, if what we've spoken about today resonates with you, uh, I'm always open for a bit of a chat like I'm with Addy. So it's been, it's been a pleasure. Beautiful. Thanks for your time.